Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is David Clary, President of Maudlin, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this third Maudlin webinar of this unusual summer. And the one today is connected with our Maudlin Means Business Series, and it's on a very timely topic, innovating in a crisis, developing a ventilator for COVID-19. And our Maudlin Fellow and Professor of Engineering, Robin Cleveland, is going to talk to the DPhil candidates, Rob Starrock and Tom Kirk, about the process of inventing and developing a ventilator in rapid response to COVID-19. Now, Robin Cleveland has been our Maudlin Tutorial Fellow in Engineering Science since 2011. He grew up in New Zealand and studied physics at the University of Auckland. His PhD was done at the University of Texas at Austin, USA, where he worked on the propagation of sonic booms from supersonic aircraft. He then spent 14 years as a professor at Boston University teaching and carrying out research in sound waves. And at Oxford, he has been researching in nonlinear acoustics with particular emphasis on biomedical applications. Rob Sturrock has had an unusual career for a DPhil student. He studied medicine at Cardiff University, graduating in 2009. He was then a foundation doctor at the Royal Centre of Defence Medicine, Birmingham. He went on to the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst in 2011 and was posted to the 16 Air Assault Brigade and worked in Cyprus and Kenya. After that, Major Starrock took a master's in plastic and reconstructive surgery at the Royal Free and UCL and then clinical medical training in London. And in 2018, he came to Oxford and Maudlin for his DPhil on bioengineering for trauma. Now, Tom Kirk studied economics and management at Trinity College, Oxford and graduated in 2017. He then became the Brian Bellhouse Scholar in Biomedical Engineering here at Maudlin. His DPhil research is on the use of functional magnetic resonance imaging techniques for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Now Robin will be talking to Rob and Tom about their research. We would be delighted if you could ask questions for them to answer using the Q&A facility on the Zoom screen. And now I'm going to hand over to Robin. Great. Good, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Robin Cleveland. Um, and uh, I'd just like to mention this presentation this morning is part of the Maudlin Means business, uh, which is Maudlin's Enterprise and Innovation Network. Um, and so all current and old members of the college who have an extra interest in, in enterprise and startups and spin-outs are welcome to join this. If you go to maudlinmeansbusiness.com, um, that's actually the organization that's been set up by, by the college to encourage our alumni to engage with the college and our students in, in making uh, business work more effectively. So this morning, it's, uh, it's my pleasure to be chatting with two very uh, accomplished uh, graduate students from our college, uh, Rob Starrick and, and Tom Cook. Uh, Rob, I've only known a couple of years, but actually Tom, when I was as in, with my other hat on as a tutorial, as a teaching fellow in engineering science, when he was an undergraduate here, he did my uh, third year project course on doing biomedical ultrasound actually for, for battlefield de deployment. So it's very funny for a couple of years later to see that he's taken that and actually turned that into something he's doing for, for in such an active way. So. For right now, I'm going to hand over to Rob, who's going to just give us a brief presentation uh, about what uh, Oxvent was and what they did. Um, we'll then stop that presentation and I will ask a few questions and then I'll monitor the question and answer window to ask uh, questions that any of you might have during, the, during this presentation. So Rob, over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um... Uh, thanks very much to everyone for joining this morning. Uh, I'm Robert Starrock uh, and I'm a, a PhD student at the university at the moment. Um, so the Oxvent project really um, uh, came about after I uh, pitched the idea to my PhD supervisor, who's uh, Professor Mark Thompson. Um, and I had been watching the um, figures erupting from uh, Wuhan and Italy and looking at the caseload that they've been experiencing, which required a high number of people that uh, needed mechanical ventilation. And the figure that stood out to me was that uh, the number of beds they had in Italy um, at the time 
was 12.6 per 100,000, which were available for critical care and mechanical ventilation. And in the UK, we had only 6.6 .6 per 100,000. So it struck me at the time that we had a significant deficit in the um, number of uh, ventilators that we would require if the pandemic played out in the way that, the, that it was being reported at the time with the knowledge that we had at the time. And I saw that there was a, a, a bit of a logistical issue here because every country was going to be faced with a pandemic. Every country was bidding for the same ventilator parts for the same industry uh, standard ventilators. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the, um, a lot of countries you know, such as you know, in Europe were, were bidding as part of a unified process. So uh, we had to find a, a novel solution to be able to release the pressure, so to speak, on, the, on that problem. And so um, I thought that the engineering department was well placed to perhaps come up with a solution to this problem that, that we might be able to cope with as in the United Kingdom. So after pitching that to my supervisor on our Monday morning supervisor meeting on March 16th, we then managed to get uh, through him pitching to the department uh, departmental support, which allowed us access to the engineering uh, technicians labs, etc. And um, over that week, we produced a prototype, which we then were picked up through, I think, our social media and, and asked to present to the cabinet office, who were at the time, unbeknown to us, running a large national ventilator program. And so the following week on March 23rd, we presented to the cabinet office and I've just got some slides here to demonstrate that process. So here on the left hand side, you can see um, our prototype, which we came up with in a week. And this is a very, this is a very multidisciplinary project across a huge number of um, departments. And during that initial week, um, we used a lot of teams and Microsoft Zoom meetings in order to be able to communicate. And we recruited a huge number of clinicians, uh, engineers, uh, and manufacturing experts that allowed us to quickly problem solve a lot of the issues. And this design was uh, was the um, kind of the baby of Professor Andrew Farmery, who's one of the uh, professors of anesthetics here at the university. And we explored both the use of a mechanical kind of compression ventilator with a motor and also using gas driven. And, and we felt at the time that because all hospitals had access to four bar air, um, that a gas-driven system potentially could be uh, more game-changing than a mechanical system which relied on the inherent properties of the motor to drive it. Um, and with quite uh, fast-paced work from our engineering team, which was, you know, DPhil students, postdocs, and we came up with this Arduino-based uh, prototype, which we were testing on the benchtop here at the university and on also on some of the mannequins up at the hospital. Um, and after being picked up by the cabinet office and pitching to them that following Monday, we were then um, attached to a manufacturing partner, which was Smith and Nephew. And um, we then, um, over that following week, had some initial discussions with Smith and Nephew. And on March 30th, took a team up, about 10 to 15 of us went up to Smith and Nephew and produced what is now the Oxvent ventilator, which you can see here on the right. Um, and we went through a process probably over about three weeks, which normally takes about 18 months. And that probably can be broken down into three areas. Um, the first area is, if I've got this correct, the first area is really to do with the driving box, which, which we came up with, which is this bag and bottle ventilator system. And, and the issues we came up against with that was that it was very easy to produce in our engineering laboratory, where we had a very, what we thought was a straightforward manufacturing concept to ask engineering departments around the country to produce them. We went to Smith and Nephew, and they had turned around their entire manufacturing facility in Hull uh, to produce up, upwards of uh, 5,000 ventilators of this source per week. We then had to deal with some of the issues to do with how are people going to manually put these boxes together, which was a, a very fascinating process to go through. And a lot of the original design concepts that we perhaps, need, perhaps had overcome, including making our own bespoke parts here in the lab, we actually chucked out the window and went back to just the original standard uh, uh, bag valve mask, which our device is based on, which is widely accessible in the in the National Health Service. So that was the kind of first issue that we we kind of faced was our integration into a quality management system and, and to a manufacturing process. Um, we had some quite interesting meetings during this process uh, with the cabinet office, and this is uh, two uh, pictures from two of those meetings, which were kind of updates to them because we then became part of this quite large ventilator challenge program, which was being widely reported in the press, uh, and. Um, the meetings were interesting largely because the first one we were on a Zoom meeting, not dissimilar to this, with Airbus and Dyson, um, who were all reporting their figures at the time of how many ventilators they were producing. 
and here you can see we've got uh, um, uh, Matt Hancock and Michael Gove on the on the Zoom as well. And then this second meeting, we were, we had it. They zoomed us from the cabinet office, which uh, um, which we thought was quite interesting. So we all crowd rounded this screen to watch that. The second issue we really faced was to do with um, software and hardware. So on the um, prototype we built on the lab, obviously we built that on an Arduino board. We actually in the background built, or the guys had been building a lot of the software uh, that would be required. But actually when we got up to Hull, uh, we then had to really start from scratch, I would say. And, and um, uh, the team had to build control algorithms in order to control the ventilation uh, system and sense the, the gas given to the patient that would moderate the amount of gas that was injected. And we then had to go through what a, is a fairly normal process, but we had to do it very fast of uh, building onto our hardware, uh, error checking our hardware and our software, and then putting in the alarm systems to make it safe if it was to become a, a medical regulated device. And that was a significant challenge, both logistically and in, in terms of manpower. That led us to our probably our second interesting photo, which um, we uh, came up, up against a logistical uh, constraint where we needed our electronics boards delivered to us literally the same day so we could get them ready for them to be able to be sent for testing as part of the regulatory approval. Um, I had the pleasure of working alongside an, an ex-military uh, RAF engineer who is a medical student at Oxford who was recruited to the program with a significant project management experience, a lady called uh, Chantel Edwards. And she was aware of military assistance civilian authorities, which is where you can ask uh, the cabinet office if they will give you military assets to help you. Um, unfortunately, we were not given military assets. We were actually given a Queen's helicopter to fly our electronic parts from uh, the south of the country up to us in Hull. And this is a, po a picture of uh, David Elder, who is the lead uh, engineer at Smith and & Nephew, and Andrew Orr, one of the DPhil students working on the project who took delivery and went onto the pad and got and got to see the helicopters. So this was quite a, a nice uh, kind of positive morale moment for the team and they were based in Hull working quite long hours. Um, and then really finally, just going back to this, our, our kind of final issues that we really had to do was the, the fast pace that we had to meet the problems we were coming up against and then find solutions to them in order to be able to make this fit to go through the regulatory assessment process. Mm -hmm at that time. And this required a significant amount of broad teamwork across, not only from inside Oxford, people who've never really worked with each other outside of a research facility, but also in a manif with, a, with a major manufacturer in their offices and having to deal with the expertise they had and potentially the expertise they didn't have. And uh, that, that is not a significant, that, that is a significant undertaking which uh, cannot be really underestimated. Um, and if it wasn't for a lot of the expertise that we that we had there and we brought from Oxford and particularly in our researchers, our DPhil students, this, this project really perhaps would have never seen the light of day. Uh, so here's just a quick video of what the prototype looked like and how the main Oxford system uh, now works before we have a chat. Respirate 15. Thanks very much. So I'll stop sharing my screen. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Rob and uh, Tom. Welcome to you too. I, th I think you you're actually sitting in I think one of the labs where you do the work for this. Is that right? Yes. Um, so the idea at this point was we would show you one of the units which is on long term test. So mm -hmm. we set one off on uh, Sunday, and we'll keep that going indefinitely because uh, we need to get some data about you know reliability over weeks. Um, it's interesting to note that the original specification that we were building our device to, the government's original, original request for help, they were only asking for a device to last 24 hours. Um, but that was very quickly thrown out the window as uh, being not very useful in a hospital if you only get 24 hours of ventilation. Uh, so we're now trying to get weeks worth of data. But unfortunately, because there are electronics works going on in the building today. I cannot take you into the lab, but I do have a device next to me. So I'm happy to talk through that in detail if the need arises. Sure. So, what's the, so what's happened to the Oxvent project within the UK now? What, what's the state of this uh, internally? So the, I think the official end point of the project came with a letter from the cabinet office 
saying thank you very much for your efforts, but you're, you're not needed on this one. Uh, we do actually have a very positive report from the regulator. Um, so it was the process of getting our device manufactured and actually used in hospitals was a two step uh, operation. The first of which was to send it to the uh, MHRA, Medicine Healthcare Re uh, Regulatory Authority, and they would certify it as safe for patient use. And then the final decision on which device would actually get manufactured at scale and used in hospitals would rest with the government, uh, Department of Health or Cabinet Office. So the official endpoint is that we built a device that, according to the regulator, met the specifications and was probably safe for clinical use. But in the end, it wasn't needed because the pandemic took a different turn. Yeah. And Rob, do you want to give us a perspective on, on what things changed that meant, at least within the UK, perhaps the need for ventilators wasn't as acute as we first were worried about back in February and March? Yeah, so I think it's worth stating up front that, uh, to my knowledge, the, vent the ventilator challenge program, which the Oxfam was a part of, I believe, is now ceased in the UK. Uh, and that program actually, in the end, only produced, I believe, a total of 2,000 ventilators, of which no novel ventilator systems like ours, I believe, made it through the, were taken through the regulatory pathway. Um, I think the significant, there were, to me, two or three things that, um, meant the risk appetite for the ventilator the new ventilators to reduce the firstly that was i think the fact that the evidence behind covid19 changed initially the clinicians were largely not using a, a continuous positive airway pressure devices which uh, to give a kind of loose description of what they are they're, they're essentially just blowing air into the patient's lungs it's very similar if you take the window down of your car and stick your head out when you're doing 30 miles an hour and they were felt to aerosolize the virus so those initially were not used but actually as as the as the pandemic went on those was adopted and you saw one cpap device was passed by the regulator um, to facilitate care so i think that eased the stress on need for mechanical ventilators i think the second thing was to do with that we in nationally we had fairly robust guidance as to who would be uh, eligible for ventilatory support particularly as the evidence suggested that those who required it were increased were very sick and so i think that relieved potentially the number of patients who are eligible and therefore the number of people who would require it etc and i think once with those two mechanisms the actual requirement for a huge number of ventilators reduced um in the uk i would, would suggest that i think in in other countries where perhaps they haven't had that national guidance they perhaps still have a requirement at the moment but that's what what essentially meant that the pressure was relieved on a lot of the systems, not just ours, on many other ventilatory systems. And so, Tom, how did you get involved in this? I mean, your research is in fMRI, all right? So that's a, that's a long way from building, the, building the ventilators. So how did you make that transition from, from working on fMRI imaging to building a uh, ventilator system? Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think I've used any of my DPhil research or skills um, on this project. Um, but that's, you know, it means I'm picking up other skills besides, which is only a good thing. Uh, so I was asked to get involved by Rob at the stage when the first prototype that Rob showed earlier uh, had been built and it was working on a desk and Sky News had been in to film it and the cabinet office had seen the footage and everyone was thinking, great, this is a potential you know, candidate. This might be the, the thing that saves everything. Um, and I was brought in at that point as a sort of technical all-rounder, odd jobs person. And in particular, I, I've worked with Jim Fisk before, who's the head of the IBME workshops. Um, we're hugely grateful for Jim putting in essentially unlimited amounts of his time, particularly at a moment in his life that was quite difficult for him. Uh, he very willingly gave up his time and worked through the night to get these first prototypes out. But the question was, how do you go from building one device per afternoon in the workshop downstairs to Smith and Nephew ultimately at the end were aiming to build uh, one device every 45 seconds to meet the order that the cabinet office placed with us, which was for 6,000 units to be delivered by a certain date. They worked backwards and decided it had to be every 45 seconds. Uh, so the, the official title I took on was system integration uh, lead which is essentially making sure all of the parts of the device work together properly. 
uh, as you've seen on the picture, there's the box at the bottom that has the um, the big rubber balloon inside it. Um, there's a lot of hardware and electronics inside the upper part of the box that's sensing pressure, sensing flow, detecting patient safety conditions, controlling the supply of air to compress the bottle, all of these things. Uh, and I was just making sure that all of these subsystems came together and played nicely with each other. Okay. So Rob, for, for you, how, so it started off with you having a, a conversation with your supervisor, Mark Thompson. So how did you then build the team both in Oxford and then elsewhere to, to be able to turn this into the, the pictures that you're able to show us? So um, Professor Thompson actually, uh, pitched it to the department and I think through that we then were able to kind of electronically send emails out to the department seeing if anyone wanted to get involved in the project with expertise that actually was a very useful way because a lot of people uh, just off their own back volunteered and came forward um, and particularly when we had uh, Professor Farmery from a clinical perspective on board that started the discussions as to what type of system we might design and actually through that, then um, it was more of a suggestion process of who might have the best expertise to do this particular part of the project. Um, and that's what led through, I think it was through Professor Farmery, who's uh, one of his previous postdoctoral researchers, uh, uh, um, Dr. Fomenti, who's now a, a senior lecturer at King's. That's how we then extended into King's College London, who uh, became one of our major, uh, the major collaborator in the project. So I, I was to a degree through kind of by word of mouth, but also through people perceived just have the best expertise to be able to solve the problem, whether that be internally or whether that be externally at another institution. Um, and as the project went on, the meetings that took place every morning at like nine o'clock on Teams just got larger and larger and larger. We initially did try to run two projects. So we actually tried to design two separate ventilator systems to see which one might be more effective. But just as the pace as the project gathered it, it just the gas driven system just seemed to have more I don't want to say energy behind it but that one seemed to be more viable at the at the offset um and then when we when we went up to Hull we were actually almost given a team they had already assigned a team to work on this project um separate to their normal work so it was we didn't necessarily have to re recruit a team up in Smith and Nephew that was kind of almost given to us and that integration worked quite well um, between the kind of senior professors who we took up PhD students etc cetera, etc cetera. that actually yeah that worked really well okay and so Tom you said you've got uh, a little system on the bench there do you want to just yeah uh, show us what you've, you've got kicking in on your bench so here is uh, a device okay. can you just did can you either tilt your screen down so you can, yeah. There we go. Oh, no, my knee. Yeah. This is what I prepared earlier. Yeah. Um, so it's plugged in at the moment. Yeah. And these are the, uh, this is the control panel. Uh, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see the numbers very clearly. Um, but the, basically the, the things you're controlling on a ventilator are a thing called the tidal volume, which is the amount of air that you're pushing into the patient each breath cycle. And you can also control the rate at which it's going in, so the breathing rate. And then finally, there's the, the ratio of inspiration to expiration. So generally, people breathe naturally at about a one to two ratio. So you breathe in one second, you breathe out two seconds, as it were. Uh, the thing is also fully battery powered. So this is a, an important regulatory requirement. If there was to be a, a power cut in a hospital or whatever context, uh, this actually has enough battery power to run for an hour and it automatically charges itself whenever it's plugged in. And then at the other end, this is the end that goes into the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, so in particular, the, the way a Ventilite such as ours is designed to be used is uh, with a thing called an endotracheal tube. Rob might be about to correct me in a minute here because mm -hmm. I'm not a clinician. Uh, but essentially, the, the endotracheal tube is going into the patient's throat, the trachea, and it forms an airtight seal there. Um, it, if it sounds quite invasive, it, it is quite invasive and people are generally sedated when they're on ventilation, so they're not really aware it's, it's happening. Um, and the most important thing of the whole kit is this little thing here, the green tube. Uh, and this is called a spirometry kit. And it is it's essentially a little pitot tube. Mm -hmm. And this is used to measure the airflow 
or flow volume that's uh, going in and out of the patient. So this is how we're able to set a target on the device of say 400 milliliters. And using this, we're able to measure in real time what is actually being delivered to the patient and we can adjust um, the supply of air from the ventilator in real time. So it's a, a negative feedback controller, which is second year engineering that I'd almost completely forgotten until this came around. Um, and this, this is also able to measure uh, static pressures. So one of the great risks with ventilation is, uh, particularly with older and frailer patients, you do not want to be pushing air very hard at high pressure into their lungs because you can cause damage to the microstructure of the lung. So you have to be very careful at how hard you're pushing in the patient. So yeah, there is our complete system. It's, uh, it's very well built. It's got a very nice design on the back of it. I don't know right, if you yeah. can see the detail. Yeah. Uh, the, the whole thing is um, a single sheet of pressed and folded steel, uh, laser cut, and then folded into shape. So although it weighs about 20 kilos, because there's a lot of batteries and kit in there, it is uh, quite a heavy, well-built unit. And I think it could take a lot of abuse. Uh, something we were thinking about regularly during the design process, uh, we were told, actually, by one of the senior clinicians who was involved in setting up the Nightingale Hospital in London, uh, they said that I can very much foresee your device being used in my hospital in the Nightingale. So something we were thinking about very often is what will the use environment be like, i.e. are these things going to be lying around on the floor underneath people's beds because it's chaotic, it's rushed, they don't have time to put in all the normal infrastructure that they would. And for that reason, we were leaning towards a very heavy duty system. Um, and well, none of them have fallen apart so far, so I think we got that. Yeah, so I think Tom has uh, highlighted a, a really key point there, which was that we were getting a lot of uh, feedback from clinicians who had heard about the project, had seen the video footage, and then were getting updates of what the, the ventilator might look like. And we were actually getting that feedback from hospitals in London, from the Nightingale, as to uh, telling us, uh, giving us an idea of where we might end up, and in what and in what environment. And we and we knew that at the places like the Nightingale, that there would be potentially one one doctor, perhaps to forty patients. So we were aware that the people who were using these machines would not necessarily be the normal users. And therefore, when we were then trying to design things like the software user interface. Um, we were trying to be quite careful that uh, really thinking about uh, could a, a doctor or a nurse or a, a technician be able to wear full PP at the end of a patient's bed and see the values on the monitor. Um, and actually, you know, we, 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 if you look at a lot of standard ventilators, they've got huge kind of iPad plasma, beautiful screens that you can touch, but actually because of the availability of what we could buy, we could only buy that small screen that you see in front of you. So, we were limited one by logistics and then had to kind of make the text as big as we could in order to make it work. And I remember having quite a few conversations with the clinical advisory group for the MHRA to try and get them to have a consensus as to what they would like to see on a screen and how large they would want it, of which they hadn't really thought about. So it was quite fascinating because we were effectively getting kind of, if the pandemic had played out in the way that it was um, hypothesized to do so initially, uh, the aim was that they would have rolled these out in places like the the Nightingale, et cetera, et cetera. Cool. And so actually, just because Tom had alluded to stuff to do with, with injury to the lungs, I'm just, if, I, if you can, there's a question from one of the, one of the attendees saying that you know, they're, they're, they understand that one of the challenges of ventilators is long-term damage. So this is from Barbara Domain Heyman. Um, is issues to do with damage to the lungs. And so the question is whether what could be done with what you've got now was how did you assess did you have the opportunity to assess whether there might have been damage associated with the, the ventilator you used and how might you change or improve the design that you've got to to reduce that moving forward so um yes i mean uh, covid nine particularly in covid 19 patients we we are we understood that they were supposedly having an, uh, what's called like an, an acute respiratory distress syndrome, uh, inflammatory response in their lungs. So they were quite difficult patients to ventilate, um, potentially with other health conditions. Um, I, I think the, the, the general 
feeling was that yes there is a risk of things like what we call barrow trauma or etc from the vent from ventilation but that um i definitely felt that they were more in need of the systems themselves and that the secondary sequelae so to speak of ventilation that they perhaps the clinicians could manage although yes you don't want to produce something that's going to absolutely annihilate someone's lungs mm -hmm. um i suppose we we kind of in the process of our design came up with a secondary solution to that, which was we brought in the assist control to allow weaning of the patients off the ventilator so that you could get them off the ventilator at some point. Um, I believe, Tom, these have now been tested in animals. So they, they have some data to look at how, yeah. how that does affect if you actually ventilating a, li a live animal or a sedated animal, so to speak. So I think Tom can allude to that. Yeah, I think the, um, in answer to the question, the, the big risk with ventilation over long term is the um, degradation of muscle um, mm. because the patient is not having to work hard to breathe and the machine is doing it for them. Um, they will, over time, lose the ability to breathe independently. Um, that is a risk when you are doing uh, mandatory ventilation, which is essentially where the patient is sedated or knocked out in a coma and the machine is doing it all for them. Uh, the other mode that we brought in at the request of the MHRA, um, and this was, a, this was a real crunch point in the design process because we were given very little notice about this change being, originally it was deemed a desirable feature and then within a very short space of time it was made almost a mandatory feature and we weren't given much notice about that and that caused a real headache to, to design around. It was a case of moving goalposts is what it felt like to us at the time. Uh, but the, the idea behind an assist control ventilation is the ventilator is waiting for the patient to initiate a breath. And then as soon as it detects that they are doing so, it will come in and support the remainder of that breath. And so crucially, the onus is now on the patient to breathe independently. And over time, the amount of assistance that the ventilator is providing, you can basically think of it as a percent of the overall effort. You can wean that down 80%, 60%, 40%. Uh, that is the mode that we were testing last, two weeks ago in Sweden on um, some sedated pigs. And the results of that were very encouraging. Right. Okay, and actually, so there's a, a related question to that from Stephen Lord. What are, what are your plans now, since COVID-19 is continuing around the world, especially in poorly resourced countries? So, Tom, do you want to answer what is, what is the plan right now for Oxvent and how you're going to be moving forward? So the, the current state of play is that this is an open source device and the the project was open source from the beginning. Smith and Nephew, to their significant credit, uh, were always on board with the principle of, being it, of it being open source from the day they came in, which is quite remarkable for a company that is as big as they are in the medical devices field. Uh, the medical industry is by no means an open, easily accessible industry. So it was a real uh, vote of confidence that they came in and wanted to keep it open source. What we mean by that is that we plan to release everything, the schematics, the software, the design, the parts list, all of it um, to the world for free. And essentially as a booklet, an entire thing that you could download. And if you so wanted, you could start manufacturing them next week. You just need to download the whole lot and read through it. Um, the two countries that are look viable in terms of uh, supplying ventilators in this pandemic are Mexico and Brazil. As you will have seen in the news, their crisis is very much ongoing and they do not have much ventilation capacity. Our device, the total cost of it is about £1,100. The price of a standard clinical use ventilator is normally between £15,000 and £20,000. Uh, so we are less than 10% of the price of the standard thing, which is why this device would make a lot of sense in a clinical context. Uh, there is talk of a human trial happening in Mexico within the next month, which would be a very important step towards certification in Mexico. Um, and then simultaneously, uh, there has been a letter that has been sent by um, a variety of clinicians and university leaders in Brazil to the UK cabinet office, asking for support in smoothing the way so that the Oxford may potentially go to Brazil. Uh, the... There are many barriers to overcome before this can happen, much though we would like it to. Um, 
chief of all is finding a manufacturing partner on the ground. At the end of the day, uh, the stakes are very high. You are putting people's lives entirely dependent upon this device. And so if they are to be manufactured around the world and used around the world, someone needs to take liability essentially for the quality management of the manufacturing. Um, Smith and Nephew have been tremendously helpful in developing it into what it is today, but they have said that manufacturing internationally and distributing these around this world is, uh, is not within their skill set. That's not something that they can take forwards. I think there's um, a couple of points to note, note on that. I think um, one of the big issues with this pandemic has been getting regulatory approval for any device. I think in the US, the FDA... I think of novel ventilators, of which that's what you'd class our type of ventilation system. I think there's really only been one, and that's the Minnesota Boston Scientific device. Um, although there have been others that have been publicized out of MIT, that is the only one that I think has actually got through FDA regulatory approval. And um, it's been a very interesting learning curve. We had, a, we had an MHRA person embedded with us in Hull who was there for the entire two weeks. We were there for the first time before he then had to move on to facilitate... Um, getting some of the Penlon systems that then became the kind of government's go-to system eventually uh, through their regulatory and manufacturing process. And he, uh, he, even he could identify the issues that were being faced by projects like ours who were uh, innovating a, a huge pace and trying to keep up from a regulatory process in order to facilitate you being able to meet those demands. And so I think um, the, a lot of the regulatory authorities are probably felt challenged themselves in this in this crisis and you almost end up in a, in a slight perpetual cycle because every country you want to go to you have to go through their regulatory approval process and unless you have you know regulatory approval process from someone like the UK or the FDA there is no way of making that easier so you have to kind of go through that whole process again which you're almost losing time for the problem that you're trying to solve which is a time limited problem so that is one of the challenges which isn't a fault of the ventilator system it's a kind of how we've traditionally done reg, uh, device regulation internationally. So I think that's one of the hurdles for any system. And actually the other systems that are out there, one that's been produced by Imperial, that's called, I think it's called JamVent, uh, which produced a pressure control system, which is the other type of ventilator that you can use, which is more commonly used in Europe and in the United Kingdom is the pressure controlled systems rather than volume control, which is what we produce. Mm -hmm. They haven't even gone through this quality management manufacturing process that the Oxvent has gone through. And I suppose that is that is the big advantage of the Oxvent is because it's been through a recognized manufacturer's quality management system. The files that you're now distributing are relatively straightforward for another manufacturer to pick up and, and be able to build to. It's much more difficult if we were still in the phase of having produced a benchtop prototype. And we were now trying to distribute that. People were now trying to distribute that across the world because they then haven't got the files. They then have to go through that whole process that we went through in Hull. So I suppose that is the uh, one of the hurdles that the ventilator process has overcome. Yep. And so there's been a, there was a pre-submitted question. Was there a point in the innovation process where you felt like you hit a wall and felt like giving up? What was that moment and how do you move past it? So Tom, do you want to do a first answer at a point where you just wanted to throw in the towel and walk away. So on the topics we've just been discussing, actually, about the different modes of ventilation, I think for the, the whole team in Hull, that would have been one of those moments. We'd been up there for about uh, 10 days at this point. And our typical Hull day was uh, meet in the lobby of the hotel at 8 o'clock. Uh, the factory is just five minutes down the road. And most nights we were getting back to the hotel at two or 3 a.m. And we did that for 16 days straight of five hours sleep, the remainder of it working. And to find out very close to, at the end of that period, just before we were about to send off our device to the regulator, um, they have a facility in Birmingham where they were testing all the, the devices to find out that they had changed the specification, this document that's called the RMVS, that was the official government's request for help. And if you wanted to enter the ventilator challenge, you needed a copy of that document and you needed to do what was set out in that document. And they changed that. And we were informed about this uh, overnight, the morning that we were going to send our device to Birmingham. 
and the communication that was coming out from the MHRA, the way that they communicated these enormous changes to the specification, things that have deep, deep consequence on every part of your system that require you to fundamentally rebuild half the software and reanalyze all of your pressures and everything like this. To, to communicate that in the way they did with the short notice that they did and to, to not even make it obvious, they, there was no notification. They never reached out to us to say, watch out, we're changing the spec. Uh, that felt like a kick in the teeth. Mm -hmm. Communication was abysmally poor throughout the whole process, I think. And then Rob, there's a question uh, from Robert Fox about if there's, a, if there's an acute second spike, um, what, based on what you've learned from this experience, how might, would, would Oxvent be something that could help with that or, or have things moved on so that may be less of an issue? Um, that's a great question because uh, all of this pandemic is about logistics broadly and about planning. And invariably there will be some form of second spike. And I think when I've chatted to many of my uh, clinical colleagues, they felt that they dealt with the first wave very well. Actually, they potentially now aren't, they don't feel that they're worried, that worried about a second spike. But um, perhaps, the, the pay, the, perhaps the turnover in workforce may mean that that second spike is difficult. I, I don't know what the government plans are for a second spike, but my understanding from where the ventilator program went was they were they were looking for what could they could meet that immediate demand. I don't think that at the time they were really focused on having a re, like having a, a resource that they bought in. So they said, well, if it comes back and we have a second spike, we've got all these systems that we can then push out into the workplace. They may have done that. I, I'm not party to that. Um, I think that in this program, that would have been a really, that potentially from an outsider would have been what I would have done with it. I would have taken the systems that I thought were likely to get through the regulatory process and then banked them in a, you know, a military site to store them in case we needed them so I could distribute them. They perhaps may have done that. I just don't have that knowledge. Um, I can see that question asked about the modus operandi and, and operandi of the cabinet office. Yeah. Um, I have to be quite careful to answer that. I, I think um, I think everyone was uh, was working at a very short timeline and trying to effectively do the best they could under the circumstances. As as always, planning perhaps makes that a bit easier. I think to echo Tom's point, we definitely were feeling how the cabinet office were meeting those demands. I think the best illustration of that actually came about, we, all the ventilators that you see, if, if you ever have, have, have time to go into a hospital and you go and look at the back of a ventilator, you'll see they all use the same piece of black hosing. And so every person who was building ventilators for the government ventilator had to buy their black hosing from the, same, uh, from the same distributor in the UK. And we, because we were having to design from scratch, I'd been down to the distributor and bought one hose. And then we put in our huge order for 6,000. And actually, I think it was Tom who went down or phoned them up. And, and none of the other suppliers had actually, and we're talking about Airbus, Penlon, who were asking to be produced 10 to 15,000 ventilators. None of them had put in orders with this supplier. And we phoned up our liaison member of the cabinet office and kind of brought this to their attention, which then a couple of hours later led to them halting, which, which was talked about in an FT article. They halted all the programs and said, right, pause, stop. We need to take check. And they went through everyone's bill of manufacturers to work out who had crossover. And, you, and we could feel that very much on the ground because you could see when they were having potentially a discussion in the cabinet office that was probably quite fraught and was quite stressful, you could see that trickle down because we all suddenly got hit by a, a huge amount of unknown which we didn't know how to meet so I, th I think that probably hopefully answers the question uh, I, I'd like to add to that as well the, the modus operandi of the cabinet office is um, they do not have any in-house technical capability whatsoever so we use consultants we get layers and layers of consultants in and in particular the consulting firm that was notionally running the whole show with the ventilator challenge was a firm called PA consulting and every team in the challenge was given a contact point at PA Consulting. And the idea was that if we needed 
logistics issues smoothing over and whatever help it might be, get in touch with your person at PA Consulting and they will do what they can to support you. Mm -hmm. So as the project went on in Hull, uh, Rob and Chantal were playing a much more sort of logistics planning role. And in particular, we were trying to get uh, 6,000 of the, the rubber balloons that are the core of the ventilator, we were trying to get them out of China and China was about to impose an export ban on all um, ventilator related equipment. So we knew when the ban was coming in, so we needed to get them out within 24 hours. And we thought, well, perfect. This is an opportunity for our man at PA Consulting. They'll surely be able to help us out. And Rob calls them up. And what effectively happens is inevitably, this happened many times over every request we ever sent their way. Uh, the guy would receive our requests, say, okay, I'll see what I can do. I'll get back to you. An entire business day would pass. You would call him in the morning. He would call you back at sort of four or five o'clock near the close of play and say, no, I'm sorry, I can't do anything. You're on your own. By which point it's the end of the working day and you have very, very few hours left in which to try and arrange your own solution. So the thing that I was most shocked by is how little capability there is in-house within the cabinet office to even grapple with these questions and our complete reliance on outside uh, people to do it and they did a shoddy job of it. PA Consulting were not particularly helpful throughout the process. Okay. Right, so there's a, there's a question from Vaughan Mitchell. What, what first time leadership skills and experiences did you develop in this? Rob, do you want to take a first stab at that? Uh, yes, so I think this was the, uh, so I've had some leadership training uh through the military uh and have in different scenarios put that into practice it's very different i think managing well uh, it's very a different style of leadership perhaps in the military than people are used to in uh the civilian working environment however the concept of leadership that they utilize actually was very useful in this particular uh, experience because we had a defined goal that we had to achieve and uh, the best way to do that was to make sure everyone understood what that goal was but also allow people who's at the best expertise to do that to get on and do that work um, so for me it was just an opportunity to to lead and manage a much larger team of which the team was made up by people who had significantly more experience in, in science and research and um, even in industry than I had. It was just giving people, the, the, giving those people the space to run, I think was the key leadership learning point. Um, I think we were also lucky in the fact that we we got leadership experience from elsewhere. I think we 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 had uh, one professor in the team, particularly who had significant industry experience, who I think was able to see how this project would go from being on the bench side to being able to go through regulatory approval. I think with no matter of good leadership, I think without that, you know, that oversight, perhaps this wouldn't have been as successful. So we were very lucky there. I think we were also very lucky by having uh, someone who'd had significant leadership ex-military leadership experience who had the project management capability as well uh who's now a medical student i think that also can't be underestimated and from a leadership perspective i don't know what tom thinks but yeah yeah luckily because there was no shortage of good leadership i didn't need to do too much of that um so then I, I'm, so then i'm going to pivot then to another question that's up there what's what's the key lesson that you learned when you were innovating during this crisis do you think tom Mm. Simple is good. Mm -hmm. I think that's um, one of the nice things about our design is, as you would expect, when a big global pandemic hits, such as this, everyone wants to build ventilators. And so if you go and try and buy all the normal parts that go into a normal ventilator, all of a sudden you discover the waiting list is six months and you can't buy any of the normal parts that would normally go into a ventilator. And so we designed ours completely. It's a motley collection of things that have nothing to do with ventilators. So the oxygen sensor, for example, that's used to detect how what oxygen fraction is going into the patient is um, from a scuba diving company. And I called them up and ordered every single uh, sensor that they had in their stock available. Um, the the rubber bag at the bottom of it, that's normally used um, in an ambulance. Paramedics 
will have a couple to spare in an ambulance so that they can just manually ventilate someone for 10 minutes on the roadside. To use it in an actual permanent ventilator is not something that's really been done before. Um, incidentally, the way that we got those out of China past the export ban was to label them as footballs, uh, which was some very clever work on Rob and Chantal's part. So, yeah, I think the, the reason I'm very pleased with our design is, and I think it's an excellent piece of engineering, we took a whole load of parts that have nothing to do with ventilators that are all cheaply available, that are all very standardised, and we glued them together. And the way we compensated for the fact that they're not normally used in ventilators is we just have some very cleverly designed control software. So the hardware is basic and simple and cheap incredibly cheap compared to normal ventilator hardware. And we compensated for that with a really well-designed, simple control algorithm. And I think that is an excellent piece of engineering for that reason. Yeah. Rob, what about you? What, were there any key lessons that you felt that you've taken out of this experience with Oxvent? I think, um, I think the, the big thing that I learned from this process was to do with, um, if you give people this, particularly, or if you give anyone, but particularly the talented people, if you give them the space and the resources to be able to work uh, together um, without the constraints of gr applying for grants, you know, that they, they're just allowed to go. They, they really can produce uh, incredible things. And I think that that was what was demonstrated. No one had to necessarily worry on the ground level about what, what they were going to have to apply for. They could, they could just run and innovate and work together and not be constrained and when you when you watch that and that teamwork it was quite a sight it was quite impressive and i think that for me is um i think it's a learning point for research actually because i think if, if people are allowed to be slightly more unconstrained that perhaps we might get more innovation so i think that was the big learning point for me right. okay. yep. and then tom were there are there any things that looking back are there things that you wish you'd done differently and I know hindsight can be twenty twenty, but are the kind of things that you, this was a mistake that, that I made that I could have perhaps done something in a different way? I think we'll never know, of course, because there is no counterfactual. An interesting question that has been raised quite a few times over the last few weeks is, um, is to do with the timing of everything. If you look at the devices that the FDA has approved, in the United States, some of them are very simple. It's not to say they're poorly designed devices by any means, but they are really very simple, some of those devices. And there is an interesting question to be asked, if we had submitted our thing at an earlier stage to a regulator that was more receptive in the heat of the moment, uh, maybe things would have played out differently. Now for that to have happened, the MHRA would have also had to have a different attitude. And at the beginning, I don't think that attitude was there. So I think it, the people who've submitted simple things to the FDA, it was partly to do with the fact that the FDA has a much better risk appetite for these kind of things. And the, the professor that Rob mentioned earlier, who has significant industry experience, he, his experience was in the United States. He's worked with the FDA before. And there were some moments where he was saying, the way this is playing out, this epitomizes the reason why, in general, big novel projects do not go through the UK regulator first. People tend to choose another country because it's a much easier process. They're much more receptive. They're much more proactive. Um, I think in defense of the MHRA, they just don't have the experience. We haven't had to deal with these things over the last few decades. And so when a pandemic like this comes along, it's, they don't know how to handle it in the same way. And then Robert, questions come up, which goes to what you're talking about, not needing to write grants. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned that seed money came from the Department of Engineering Science to get you started. But then how did the funding work for the ventilator challenge after that? Yeah, so we were very lucky because uh, uh, Professor Thompson applied for seed funding from the department, which was great, and we got backing from them. So that kind of started the process and allowed us to produce the prototype. When we then went to the cabinet office and were uh, put together with Smith and Nephew, uh, the cabinet office um, backed our, or put in an order for 6,000 ventilators, 
on the proviso they would remunerate Smith and Nephew for the cost of production of that of that up to the tune, I think if it was up up to the tune of six or seven million pounds. So the project was funded uh, up to about six million pounds to get to the ventilator you see who you have seen victims of today. That was where the funding from. And I, I believe now, um, obviously because that cabinet office process is closed, the funding is now, uh, they are applying for kind of Innovate UK or grants, et cetera, to fund the, the company that is formed for Oxvent because you needed to form a company in order to be able to pivot the designs and the quality management documents to other countries. So that's kind of how the funding process has evolved for that. But yes, we were heavily reliant on the government's program that essentially funded that kind of research. Okay. And then the, the presence, as I asked, you said you mentioned uh, having uh, seen Matt Hancock and Michael Gove, but he's, he was curious whether you've met other people like Chris Whitty or Patrick Valance as part of the process to do with Oxvent. Uh, no, we, we had um, some great advice from I think it's Mohammed Amersi, who is a Oxford alumni, who I think has a lot of work with the innovation hub here at Oxford. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of our actually a Professor Orselin, who is was our key collaborator at King's. I think he was actually working on an app that was doing diagnostics, and he had a lot of. In, uh, although he didn't know it at the time, he was having a lot of uh, discussions with Sir Patrick Balance and Chris Whitty, but we did not know. Um, yeah, we we only we were only dealing indirectly with Matt Hancock and, and Michael Gove and Sir Gareth Reese williams who I think is the Chief Commercial Officer for the government. Great. Okay, so I think we're coming towards the end of our time here. So thank you, Rob and Tom, both for spending some time with us. And, but, but mostly thank you for, I mean, the real time and effort you put in has, has been those countless hours over the last two and a half months um, doing all sorts of work for, for the good of everybody. And that, I really appreciate that and I think but I think also, at least from what I've gathered from our conversation, right, it is being in a place like Oxford, you know, you were, when you sent out emails to people to help, right, you, you, you had a diversity of, of people who were able to bring all sorts of different expertise, you know, and very quickly be able to bring a team together. And I think that was a, it was a really huge thing that came out of that. So I think to close, I think the president would like to say just a few words to close. I'll just hand over to, to David Carey now. Yeah, well, I'd just like to reinforce what uh, Robin has just said, and uh, this has been a really great story. And I think both uh, Rob and Tom, you've just shown how our DPhil students can step up to the mark in a crisis. Uh, and uh, of course, it's not only the ventilator work, there's other really important work in, on the medical side going on in Oxford. Uh, with uh, our own Adrian Hill leading the team on the vaccine project and other people doing work on drug treatment. So uh, I think we're very proud at Maudlin of what you've been doing and, and I'd like to congratulate you. I think we should also thank uh, Shelley Ma and Madeline uh, Rollemont, Anna Norman and others in the development office for arranging such another really great webinar and I think we should look forward to more of these in the future. And I'd also like to thank all of the participants for leaving it, for logging in and listening quite early in the morning. And uh, I hope we see you all again soon. Thank you. <laughs>